Number one, don't buy a compact tractor without a loader. You're gonna regret that decision once we get to point number two. Knowledge is power, so use this to your advantage to negotiate a fair price. Well, good luck to you. That's gonna be a tough hill to climb. You're gonna be searching for a needle in a haystack. The first question that I always ask is, do you have the three-point arms as well? Well, <laughs> that's not really the best time to be asking that kind of question. You wanna ask that ahead of time. Now, as we go through this list here of different points to consider, I want you to bear in mind at the high level that you can use a lot of these for negotiation purposes, all right? So well, then you can use that to your advantage and get that price down. Welcome back everybody. Today we have 10 tips to help you avoid disaster in the used market. My business was founded on buying and selling used equipment, tractors and tractor attachments. I got burned quite a few times myself, but as I did it more and more, I got burned less and less. So I wanna share those tips with you. If you're out there shopping for a used tractor or an attachment, it's easy to get tripped up. So I wanna give you my advice. You know, you wanna avoid those pitfalls. You're going to the used market to save money for a reason, right? To get a good value maybe get something that was lightly used. But if you make the wrong decision, it can wind up costing you as much as buying new. Now, one thing you don't want to buy used are going to be your wheel spacers, all right? And we are proud to be sponsored by Bora. If you are looking for a quality made in America solution, Bora can help. Tractors are naturally tippy side to side, especially if they have a cab on them. You can really feel top heavy. So if you add a set of spacers, you widen your footprint, you get more stability. Check out the link down below. Now, number one on this list probably seems pretty obvious, but I get a lot of emails about this pretty frequently, so obviously there's a lot of guys out there that don't find it obvious. And that is gonna be, if it's too good to be true, then it probably is. If you are seeing any kind of a modern day tractor out there with a loader, with a mower for $5,000, it's just not real, okay? If it seems too good to be true, if you've noticed when it's posted, say it's been up for a week or two, and nobody else just came across it, well, that should be a sign right there if the price didn't give it away. A deal like that, and I found some really good deals in my day, they're gonna be sold in the first day. They're gonna be sold instantaneously. Otherwise, forget about it. It's not true or they just haven't taken the posting down. Another one that's become more and more common is actually taking other people's information and just reposting it in a different listing as well in a different area of the country or a different platform. I have that happen a lot or I used to at least with my own tractor listings. We used to put uh, Goodworks tractors, the, the sign right in the background of it to help prevent some of that from occurring. However, there would still be folks in other states or other platforms that are using our pictures, even copying and pasting our description and using it for their own. So some of these things can be hard to pick up on, but if you see a picture or a name in a background that says like Goodworks Tractors like we do, then you could always go to our website and see if we have it listed for sale on there as well. That would be a good way to get reassurance. So one of these things that's really hard to spot if you only have pictures or video online and you're not seeing the tractor in person is gonna be corrosion. Now, sometimes there could be things that are giveaways, right? So if you're buying a tractor or looking at a tractor that's in the Northern climate or it's up in Canada, and let's say it doesn't even have a loader on it, it only has a snow Blower, well then you can probably safely assume it was used for snow removal as a primary purpose. That in and of itself doesn't bother me a whole lot, but if I do see a spreader on the backside, well that is cause for concern. So typically if I see that or even just a snow blower on front, I'm going to ask for more up close pictures of the whole subframe on the front and on the back end. Underneath, I want to see what kind of potential corrosion issues are going on on the linkage, on the wearable parts, on the wiring. Those kinds of problems can be very persistent and very hard to correct depending on how advanced they are. And simple steel parts aren't gonna be the end of the world. You can typically strip those off and recoat them or repaint them. But if you get too much into that electrical system, that's when you can have those problems down the road. I had a skid steer a couple years ago that I bought for myself and it came from a snow removal company down in Ohio. And everything worked just fine for the first period of time, maybe, I don't know, three or six months or whatever we had it but then it started to have issues starting and we had to have a John Deere technician come out multiple times because he was just chasing after what it was. He would replace a battery, replace a ground wire, replace this, that, the other thing. Now, eventually he was able to get that problem resolved, but it required a lot of trips, a lot of little trial and error things. It cost a lot of money to do, and it was all because it was used in snow removal, even though this machine only had a couple hundred hours on it. So the flip side could be other corrosive environments as well. You will hear about it sometimes in coastal climates, if you're right along an ocean, or if you happen to get into a flood tractor situation, that's a tough thing to try to identify and see if that happened or not. You're really relying on the seller to be forthright and tell you what occurred there. And I also had one tractor that came from a chicken farm at one point, which must have just been that maybe acidic environment, I'm not sure, but it had so much material, uh, manure, everything else up underneath the subframe where it collected and sat for a long time where that got into the electrical system and caused some corrosion issues as well. Now, as we go through this list here of different points to consider, I want you to bear in mind at the high level that you can use a lot of these for negotiation purposes, all right? So they could be red flags where you wanna completely avoid it. However, if you do your due diligence and determine, well, hey, it's gonna cost this much or it's gonna be a lot of my time to repair this or fix this or whatever, 
well then you can use that to your advantage and get that price down. Hey now, if you are enjoying today's video, I would love to have you follow along. You gotta hit that subscribe button down below. You can see more videos like this. In fact, we have over 450 other videos all about tractors and attachments. You gotta check those out too, so hit subscribe. And if you're watching, you probably own a tractor or will be soon, so we sell tractor attachments. We sell them and ship them all over the country, as a matter of fact. You can check out what we have to offer at goodworkstractors.com. We're happy to help. Okay, this one is an easy pitfall to get sucked into, and a little bit is subjective as well, depending on what is important to you. And you'll see this all the time. It could be in the listing of a tractor that's for sale, or for me, when dealers reach out and tell me what they, they have to offer, or even a private individual if they want to sell their tractor. They're going to list out all those little modifications, little upgrades, little accessories here and there, and try to build that up and make it seem like you're getting so much more and that's gonna justify the price. And so this is where it pays to be very astute, very discerning in what you know about your tractors and what's important to you and the features and the options to have. So oftentimes you're gonna see a whole lot of items that maybe only add up to a few hundred dollars, right? And they could list off extra lights they have on there, maybe a cutting edge, maybe a steering wheel spinner, maybe a seat cover, maybe fender flares, all that kind of stuff. And in the grand scheme of things, yes, those are really nice things to have on your tractor. However, there's this misconception that they add a lot more value than what they really cost. Now, if you compare those kinds of accessories or add-ons to this next list, such as extra hydraulics on the front or the back of your tractor, could be a single point connection to disconnect the hydraulics on your loader, it could be an air ride seat, it could be a top and tilt kit, there's some other features, some other accessories out there that could cost $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. And you don't want to take that with a grain of salt because oftentimes those are going to add a lot of additional value, not just on the monetary sense, but to the operator as well. And so, of course, this is my list, right? This is me saying what I think is maybe less important versus more important based on a monetary value. But it's going to help you put things into perspective because a lot of the tractors are set up differently out there. And so you can weigh what's more important or less important or see if you can have them uh, take it off the tractor and not sell it with it. But it's also going to help you sometimes make a decision easier, right? So if you have two tractors that you think on the surface look very similar and maybe one has an air ride seat and that doesn't stand out, but you notice a couple of rear remotes on the back too, that right there alone could be an extra two twenty-five hundred dollars in value right there that the other one doesn't have. So really this isn't about the quantity of accessories or upgrades that you have available, it's about what specifically those upgrades are. Oftentimes you're going to hear about the great deal that somebody got from their friend or their family member when they were selling their tractor. Now there's no doubt there are some good deals that come up now and then buying from friends and family member. Oftentimes though, I'm sent what somebody did after the fact, right? They're like, hey, I just got this tractor. It came with this, this, the other thing. I got it for this much. What do you think? Did I get a good deal? Well, <laughs> that's not really the best time to be asking that kind of question. You want to ask that ahead of time. Oftentimes they're getting it for just a traditional market value, sometimes a little bit more, a little bit less. It's not a great deal. But what I think is one of those important things about buying from a, a family member or a friend compared to a complete stranger is that you can typically have some more history about what that machine is all about, what it was used for, maybe the, the maintenance period, the maintenance intervals that were done on it as well. And so that's something that's going to be challenging to find typically in the used market is going to be service history, service intervals, how it was maintained. Now, if it was maintained at a dealer, which some machines are, a lot of them aren't, right? then you can sometimes get that service history pulled out from that dealer, which is nice to have. But that's one of the reasons why I like to stick with fairly low hour equipment and not with uh, equipment, let's just say a thousand hours or more, which most tractors can get a lot more than a thousand hours on it. But by the time you get to that thousand hour interval mark, you should have had probably five oil changes, you know, several hydraulic oil changes, air filter changes, fuel line changes, a lot of greasing that goes on. But you get to a certain amount of hours on a machine, I guess, that I become uncomfortable and that a bit of that is arbitrary. There's no complete line in the sand. I think a thousand hours for me is just a, a, a good reference mark because I think you can defer maintenance for a certain period of time and you're going to be okay. Not that it's ideal, but the longer you defer that maintenance or there's the potential for deferred maintenance, you know, if this guy owned a tractor for a thousand hours and has no service history, doesn't know anything about it. Well, who's to know if it ever had an oil change? And so for me, the two routes to go are either to buy equipment with lower hours on it, the closer to zero, the better, you know, maybe 200, 400, 500 hours, or buy from somebody that you know the service history with. And so for me, that's why you typically see that low hour equipment, right? If something has 200, 400 hours on it, there's only been one or two major service intervals to be had on that machine so far in its life. And I think human beings kind of have that natural tendency to care more about their equipment the newer it is versus the older it is. So if it only has a couple hundred hours, it was more likely to be maintained compared to a very high hour machine with an unknown maintenance history. We've all heard the saying, a picture says a thousand words, and I believe that to be quite true on most levels. <laughs> However, there are times when it can be deceiving as well. And you can use that 
deceiving nature to your advantage. And so one of the first things I like to look for when I'm looking at pictures of a used tractor that is a thousand miles away from me is just the overall physical appearance, right? And you want to look for signs of fading, uh, for maybe the seat being really mildewy or stained or ripped up. And the other immediate areas I look to are going to be on the front end loader down by the bucket, as well as a mower deck or a backhoe to see what kind of use they had on them, how much paint is worn off, if it's scraped up, if it's rusty, if it's dented in, what kind of condition that looks like. Now, if a tractor is faded and the seat's all mildewy and everything else, then you know that that tractor's been sitting outside for a period of time, or it's a Kubota. <laughs> but on the buckets, the mower decks, and the backhoes, all those tools right there, those attachments, are made to make contact with the ground. The mower decks, not intentionally, but the outsides are gonna scuff up when they're going around shrubbery and around the occasional um, fence posts that they might hit or uh, boulders and landscaping, all that kind of stuff too. So you can expect there to be somewhere on those different locations. And while it can cosmetically not look great, you can also try to negotiate that price down. The same thing can be said with dents as well, especially on loader buckets. You're gonna see oftentimes the top rails, like we talked about John Deere's bad design and what you can do to fix that, or even the sidewall edges too. There are standard duty buckets, there's heavy duty buckets. Every manufacturer designs their buckets a little bit differently. And just because a bucket is dented up or creased or ripped even on the steel doesn't mean that it necessarily was an abused machine. And so what I would suggest in a situation like that, if it looks like it's been heavily used on the surface is to investigate closer, the pins, the bushings, all those joints that are moving to see if they were properly greased or if there's a lot of slop, a lot of play in there, or if they're completely dried out or they're going to have excessive wear. And that's how you get that slop really. So those are the signs you want to look for. If somebody's just been using their equipment and those wearable parts, you know, on the bucket, on the backhoe, on the mower deck are just showing some signs of being actually used, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Now, as far as fading goes on the metal surfaces, on the polymer surfaces, typically that's not going to be too much of a deal. There were some really old John Deere's that became very brittle on the plastics, but the newer ones don't really have that problem. My main concern with fading would be on the rubber hoses, you know, maybe on the tires, but those softer materials that are going to wear out a lot quicker, become more brittle, could crack, could leak, could break down a lot quicker over time if they are exposed to the elements. And so again, if you have some of those cases that come up with the faded equipment, just ask for more close up pictures. If you can't get there to see it in person, just get a closer visual, a better look at what it is. And if you don't like what you see, just back out. But it's the same thing. These are all negotiation tactics. If you see a couple of hoses that look like they need to be replaced, hoses are a couple hundred bucks in the grand scheme of things. Shouldn't necessarily be a complete red flag to avoid the machine. Just use it to your advantage. Okay, let's talk about backhoes for a minute a couple different points to make number one if you are buying a tractor with a backhoe on it in the used market the first question that i always ask is do you have the three-point arms as well a lot of these smaller tractors in particular like the kubota bx's the 1025 r's you remove all those three-point arms to put the backhoe on and so it doesn't really even cross your mind to ask the question right and i got burned by this a couple of different times over the years however it's it's pretty much ingrained in my head to make sure i ask that question right away but if you do not have those three-point arms they are going to be astronomically expensive from John Deere at least to buy replacement arms from Kubota. It's an easier pill to swallow, but it's still an unexpected expense that could cost you several hundred dollars at the bare minimum. Now let's say you have a tractor and you want to add a backhoe onto it. Let's say you have a John Deere 1025R and you want to add on the 260 backhoe to it. It's really more complicated than that because you can't get just the backhoe. You need to make sure you get the entire subframe assembly that comes along with it. You need to get the Power Beyond rear hydraulics or plan on getting that new from John Deere. And then depending on which generation of backhoe you get, it may have its own seat, but if it's the earlier generation, it does not have a seat and you need to get a swivel kit for the main John Deere 1025R seat. I found out the hard way on that one time I had bought a 1025R with the backhoe on it you know already had the subframe on there it had the power beyond everything else that was hooked up properly and I went to rotate the seat around it didn't have the swivel kit so he had added that backhoe on after the fact and not got that swivel kit which ended up being a two thousand dollar expense so needless to say I had marked the price down and advertised it as not having that swivel kit and just letting the buyer decide what they wanted to do let's spend just a minute on loaders I got a few things to tell you about that number one don't buy a compact tractor without a loader you're going to regret that decision once we get to point number two. If you own a tractor and want to add a front end loader to it and you're looking in the used market, well, good luck to you. That's going to be a tough hill to climb. You're going to be searching for a needle in a haystack. It's very, very challenging to find loaders out there in the used market. If you bought a used tractor, 
then you wanted to save some money, right? So you're going to the used market again to try to find that loader to match. Otherwise, you're kind of negating those savings by going to the new market to get a loader to put on your used tractor. Second point, if you do get lucky enough to find a used loader out there, you need to make sure it has the right brackets to go along with it and fit your tractor. A really good example of this is gonna be the John Deere 3R series or the previous generation, the 3X20 series. Those tractors use the same loaders for all of their models. However, the mounts for a cab station versus an open station are completely different. And that mistake will cost you hundreds of dollars at the bare minimum. And lastly, I say it again because no matter how many times I've said it, the mistake keeps happening, but do not buy a loader without a quick attach bucket on it. I don't care if it's a John Deere quick attach or the skid steer quick attach, stick with those two options. Having a pin bucket is gonna severely limit you on what you can do with your front end loader. Having a quick attach bucket, meaning you can quickly take it right off, is gonna allow you to put a grapple on there, a snow pusher, pallet forks, a bale spear. The list goes on and on, so don't buy a loader without a quick attach bucket. Okay, so let's talk about front mount snow blowers, and this is kind of the same concept as with the loaders and with the backhoes. Now, John Deere is a really good example. They're gonna use the same 54 and 47 inch snow blower from the X7 series through the one series, through the old generations of the two series as well. And the same blower to work, but that is about it. All the components, the parts, the pieces that are behind that blower are gonna be completely different. So the quick hitch, the short PTO shaft, the long PTO shaft, uh, the carrier bearing, the, um, the adapter bracket that's on there, sometimes the RIO cabling for the reverse override sensor. All that stuff is very unique to the specific tractor model. And if you find one off of an X7 series, it is not gonna match up on your 1025R and vice versa. So if you are shopping in the used market to get one of those set up for your machine, I would encourage you to do some more homework ahead of time. Try to find a snowblower manual, um, all the manuals that go with it, or consult your local dealer so you can get a full parts list of what is included and required to fit your machine. That way you can go through a checklist when you're shopping in the used market, ask that seller what they have available. There are gonna be some brackets that are bolted onto the tractor that need to be taken off as well and included typically. This is very important because if you go to that dealer after the fact, you're gonna pay through the nose to get these parts brand new, and again, you're going to the used market to save some money. So if you make a mistake there, it's gonna wind up costing you just as much as new. Now, similar to the snow blowers, mower decks are gonna experience the same kind of issue. This is primarily a John Deere thing, but it does apply to Kubota and the other brands as well. Now this gets very, very confusing because there could be 54, 60, 72 inch decks that are in multiple designs made for uh, a two series tractor, a one series tractor, an X7 series, a three series, uh, X5 series, you get the idea, they're all very specific. It could be completely different deck designs, but still the same nominal width of 54, 60, 72, but they could be belt driven, they could be PTO driven, they could have different brackets on them. So you need to do your homework, make sure it came off the exact model or one of the few compatible models that it'll work with. And then you also need to make sure it comes with all the correct bracketry. Oftentimes there's gonna be front hanger brackets, rear hanger brackets, the PTO couplings on both sides, the, the male and the female sides, if it has an auto connect system. And some of the larger series, like the new John Deere 2 series, like the 2032 and 2038R, have their own command cut. It's like an electric over hydraulic system that has a lot of controls up here on the, uh, the fender that would be very expensive to remove and then add onto a different tractor, so I don't even bother doing that. Same thing on the 3R, you have a hydraulic deck lift to control your mower deck raising and lowering. There's just a lot that goes into it. It really complicates things, and at this point I really try to avoid dealing with those individual parts and pieces whenever possible and so I will say that I find myself more and more wanting to avoid those kinds of situations and I'm reluctant to remove a mower deck I'm reluctant to split up a snowblower a bagger system anything like that from the tractor a backhoe is another good example too because they're just it's too easy for me to not realize that there's a part that went with it when I take it off um, or it's too cost prohibitive to take it off of this tractor and put it on the other one it just opens up a can of worms where there's too much risk for me and not enough reward. Guys, well, hopefully that was helpful. This is meant to save you a lot of money and a lot of headaches in the long run. Do your due diligence ahead of time before you spend the money. If you need some help, ask somebody, right? You know, I try to answer as many questions as I can. I can't get to everybody, but ask your dealer if you need help with it, you know? Just don't spend the money without knowing what you're buying. So whether you're a tractor newbie or a tractor pro, we have all sorts of videos out there, stuff you can learn from, stuff you, can avoid <laughs> we make those mistakes for you we have over 450 videos and counting we'd love to have you tag along i want to thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by and until next time stay safe we'll see you soon